So watch what happens live has since deleted that little clip from the episode. What does Ryan do? Ryan hires the same attorney that Jim Bellino used to sue Tamara in 2019 for defamation. And welcome to another episode of Morgan's Pop Talks, breaking down the latest in reality TV and pop culture. We have a lot to get to today because the world is always in a state of chaos. That's what it feels like, doesn't it? Um, I do have a little bit of housekeeping to attend to today. Some bad news to start the show. Don't love to do it, but sometimes it's got to be done. Well, let me just be honest. It's actually great news for me. Um, well... It depends on how you look at it. I'm going to look at it the glass half full. I'm going on my honeymoon. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. After however many months, we've actually almost been married for a year now. <laughs> um, October 20th is our official wedding date. You guys know I just had a big shebang in the summer uh, to celebrate with my friends and family, but we actually eloped uh, last year when he was you know, 90 day fiance, the clock was ticking down and we had absolutely no time to waste. But anyways, haven't gone on a honeymoon yet. So I am getting the heck out of Dodge. I'm going to Punta Cana, baby, Sunday morning, not Sunday morning, Monday morning, 6am flight. We're getting out of here. So that's the great news. Like, don't get it twisted. It's great news. But that also means there's not going to be an episode of MPT next week which is just truly heartbreaking. Honestly, I get upset when I don't have an MPT episode as well because um, in this line of work, let me tell you, let me tell you, the competition is fierce because I know if you're not listening to me, you're listening to somebody else. So while I'm on my honeymoon, I'm going to have a spiral about how my career is over because I miss one podcast episode. That's the way my mind works. You know, it just is. But I told myself I'm going on this vacation and I'm not talking to anyone. I, I told that to my husband, David, the other night. I said, listen, when we're on our honeymoon, I don't want anyone to text me. I'm not answering. I don't want anyone to call me. I'm not answering. If you DM me, I probably will answer you because um, I like you guys and I care about you. Uh, but other than that, I'm like, you know what? I'm not doing it. And I told him I'm not working either. I give it like a day. You know, if something catastrophic happens, I'm just going to be giving you pop culture updates on the beach in a lounge chair. And that's just how it's going to be. Okay. So that's my PSA for the day. I've gone a little overboard on preparing for the honeymoon. Um, I'm going crazy out here, buying lots of clothes like the Menendez brothers. And David and I are watching Monsters. That's a discussion for another day. I'm out here swiping the card left and right. And you know... You know what it just really aggravates me about myself is that I knew that I was going on this trip to Punta Cana for like three months. And you know, you would think that I would want to buy some summer dresses, some beach dresses like in the summer so that I could get some more use out of them. No, nope, I'm just going to drop $200 on October 2nd on five different dresses so that I can wear them for a week and then put them back in my closet until next summer when I probably won't like them anymore. You know, it's a circle of life some would say. And the way that I am uh, telling myself that it's okay that I'm doing this is that it's my honeymoon. It's my honeymoon. And you only go on one honeymoon in your life. So swipe the card. And you know what else I told myself? Well, Morgan, you're buying everything on Amazon. It's $50 maxi dress. Like at least you're not out here spending 200 bucks on Revolve, you know? So I'm, t I'm talking myself off the ledge in a lot of ways. And it's girl logic and it makes me feel better about myself. And to be completely honest, I love all the outfits that I got and I'll link them for you. Okay, so no episode of MPT next week. Let's get into the pop three biggest headlines of the week. We have to talk about Diddy updates. I feel like for the next year, the first story in the pop three is going to be some sort of Diddy update, but there was this bombshell press conference this week that everybody is talking about. Um, Tony Busby, he's an attorney out of Houston, and he is representing 120 individuals in civil lawsuits against Diddy. 
Um, the things that stuck out about this particular press conference um, is one, him saying, we're going to name them. We're going to Sutton Strack name them. Not saying that Sutton Strack was involved. I'm just, I'm just allude, you know, I'm, I'm, what's the word? Attributing the quote to her name them. He's going to name the people that were complicit. He's going to name the people that were involved because of these 120 individuals, there are other celebrities that they have named in these lawsuits along with Diddy. So people are talking about that. The second thing people are talking about, the ages of the alleged victims at the time of of when the alleged assault occurred and the allegations of how all of this went down. So let's start there. Uh, Busby said that many powerful people and many dirty secrets will be exposed in the upcoming days. He said he will reveal the bystanders and willing participants who encouraged and egged it on alongside Combs. He says the day will come when we will name names other than Sean Combs, and there's a lot of names. It's a long list already, but because of the nature of this case, we're going to make damn sure, damn sure, he reiterated, that we're right before we do that. The names will shock you. Then he says, I would imagine that as we speak here, there are a myriad of people who are very nervous can't hide skeletons in the closet forever. I would expect there are many people out there right now who are desperately searching their memories as they delete their texts and data. He says, my team has pictures, videos, texts. They have proof, receipts, timeline, screenshots. And as far as details coming out about these alleged incidences, Busby said that Diddy's youngest victim was just nine years old when the alleged assault took place. 25 of them were minors, and then it would happen at auditions of these young kids. He said, quote, this individual was sexually abused, allegedly, by Sean Combs and several other people at the studio with a promise to both his parents and himself of getting a record deal. And then another similar story about a 15-year-old. Of course, Diddy's team and his lawyer, Erica Wolf, one of his attorneys, Erica Wolf, said this, as Mr. Combs' legal team has emphasized, he cannot address every meritless allegation in what has become a reckless media circus. That said, Mr. Combs emphatically and categorically denies as false and defamatory any claim that he sexually abused anyone, including minors. He said he looks forward to proving his innocence and vindicating himself in court if and when claims are filed and served where the truth will be established based on evidence, not speculation. A lot to unpack here, right? You know, when I was posting about this on social media, um, I mean, all of it sticks out to me, right? But but what people really cling to are these other names. Who are these other names? And of course, there's been stuff floating around the internet. You see old videos of Diddy showing up to the Kardashian house and you see old videos of, Ashton Kutcher being with Diddy and like just because they're at each other's houses doesn't mean they knew anything right but people are ready like people are ready and waiting for this type of stuff to happen but they also don't believe that it actually will because of what we went through with Epstein right people are saying I'll believe it when I see it um and then other people are saying, I don't think anything's going to shock us. I think we have already kind of seen what is out there. I think we're bracing for impact. And if these names come out, when these names come out, it'll just confirm the suspicions that we already thought. Um, other than that, I worry about Tony Busby's safety. I mean, don't, that was my first thought. He's out here and like, it was such a it was such a, like, I'm going to burn you all to the ground press conference that everyone was like, yes, finally, somebody doing something, somebody with power, you know, it, being able to do something. And then as I was talking to David about it, he's like, he better get some security. And I think he would definitely have to do that. But we will see. I mean, he said that he was going to start filing these claims within the next 30 days across different states that it happened in. And when he files the claims, that's when these names are going to come out. So uh, we will see. Let's move on to something a little lighter in comparison. Kristen Cavallari revealed this week that she broke up with her 24-year-old Montana boy's boyfriend, Mark. Um, we all know the age difference. She's 37. He's 24. She did a very emotional podcast episode about it. Um, and she's like, you know, my little birdie just needs to get out there and fly 
and spread his wings and jump from the nest. Like, I need to kick him out of the nest. This little thing called life. You know, she's like, nothing bad happened. There's no cheating, no love loss, no anger. That baby bird just needs to fly. That baby bird just needs to fly. She said, I just know long term he needs to experience life. He's young. I started to feel the age a little bit with life experience. She said, I look back when I was 24 and how much life has happened between then. Those are crucial years and those are formative years. They're when you find yourself and he needs to be able to do that. So Kristen breaks up with Mark and then she says, I know one day he's going to look back at it. He'll understand and he will thank me. And we're all like, girl, Yes, hello. But when you're in it, when you're swept up in it, it's like the best relationship that you've ever had. At least that's what she said. It's easier said than done to walk away because of this age difference, right? And it was probably exciting for her to be in this relationship with this 25-year-old model, right? That could bench press her at any given second of the day. My thing is, she should have known that this man needed more life experience when she realized that he was in a TikTok group called Montana Boys with a Z with a Z. Um, it, like that wasn't the red flag. The last time I used a Z in something to like identify myself was 2009. My AOL screen name, Morgs World, Morgs with a capital Z, right? So that's just a surefire way to tell if somebody's too young for you. So that's my PSA for the day for all of you out there still in the dating pool. If your love interest is putting a Z where there should be an S, they are too young for you. Okay. You're welcome. Let's move on to Ariana Grande defending her relationship with Ethan Slater. So she did a cover story for Vanity Fair where she talks about how the media portrayed her relationship with Ethan Slater. So she said, of course, you guys know they met on the set of Wicked. They were married to other people while they were shooting this movie. They got separated and they got divorced. And now they come out from filming this movie and they're dating each other. So this is what she said. I went through a lot of life changes during the filming of this movie. A lot of people that were working on it did. We were away for two years. So, of course, I understand why it was a field day for the tabloids to sort of create something that paid their bills. She says the most disappointing part was how many people believed the worst version of it. Um, although saying she will never go into certain details about her relationship with him. She said, no one on this earth tries harder or spreads themselves thinner to be there for the people that he loves and cares about. There is no one on this earth with a better heart. And that is something that no BS tabloid can rewrite in real life. Let's go back on the timeline. They were first romantically linked in the summer of 2023. Filming for Wicked started in December of 2022. So they had been working on this project together for about six months, right? Ethan Slater files for divorce on July 26th of 2023. At that time, Ethan had been with his wife for a decade. They had an 18-month-old son. Although, depending who you ask, Ethan had been separated from his wife for two months before he filed for divorce. That's one side of the story, at least. Ariana filed for divorce from Dalton Gomez on September 18th of 2023, so not long after. Lily J is Ethan's ex-wife. She did an interview with Page Six uh, in July of 2023, and she said, Ariana's the story, really, not a girl's girl. My family is just collateral damage. However, there's really a lot of conflicting sentiments in this interview that Lily J did with Page Six um, because sh she never comes out and like says anything explicitly, right? She's like, the story is about Dalton and Ariana. The story my family is just collateral damage, right? But then another source told page six that she's been calling every news outlet to get this story out while acting differently towards Slater behind the scenes. She's telling Ethan and others that she only cares about protecting their child. She's rightfully upset because her marriage fell ap apart, but Ariana and Ethan didn't do anything wrong. That's what the insider said, right? Saying that they had been separated before Ariana and Ethan got together. Ethan's trying to take the high road in hopes he can resolve the situation for the sake of their child. Whatever the timeline may be, honestly, we will never know. My thing with this is that the way that this situation was handled was actually mind boggling to me from somebody who has as much star power as Ariana Grande, who knows that 
unfortunately for her, being this mega superstar, that her personal life is under a microscope. Where's her PR team? Like how this all came out was so messy. Like you would think that they would have a plan intact. Like if they they know the optics, they know how that looks. It doesn't look great. Like even when you explain it in detail and you give your side of the story, it still doesn't look great. So the fact that she's this mega superstar with the world at her fingertips when it comes to people writing statements for her and on her behalf and crafting a public image for her, for it to have gone this badly, I'm like, how? How did that happen? And here's my thing. I know that people are always like, well, the tabloids and the media and whatever, they have no privacy. I, I think celebrities know how to keep things private when they want Right, because all you have to do is look at the celebrities that are in the headlines a lot. Right now, right, right now, like Beyonce and Jay-Z are in headlines a lot, right? Because of their relationship. We don't really know what it was with Diddy. But in the past, I mean, they've been together for how many years? The one elevator incident with Solange was a headline, right? But there's tons of other like infidelity rumors and whatever, but there wasn't that many headlines about it. So I feel like celebrities know how to keep things private when they want. And when they don't, a la JLo, I feel like JLo is one of the people that thrives in chaos, that loves to have, you know, tabloids written about her, that loves to see her name in the little link, you know, little link in the bio. So I don't know. I just truly don't understand it. To be completely honest with you, I don't understand it. Um, I don't understand the relationship. I mean, I know I don't know either of them, so I guess I shouldn't say that. But I talk about this a lot. We all have that one relationship where we look back and we're like, what were we thinking? Why Why did we date SpongeBob SquarePants? You know, like, oh, I don't want to be, I'm trying not to be mean here. I really am. But we all have that person in our past where they're just like goofy and their personality makes them more attractive. But then you're five years removed and you're like, what? Like, why didn't one of my friends slap me across the face? You know, I kind of feel it that way in this situation. Anywho, that's all I have to say about that. Let's move on to this week's deep dive. I'm going to get into a couple of different stories that happened uh, involving the Real Housewives of Orange County cast within the past week because there's not just fun. There's a situation going down between Tamara, Eddie, Ryan, and Jen. There's also a situation with Shannon. So where to even begin? I mean, I guess we can start with lawsuits. Lawsuits are always a good place to start, right? Um, and all of these things transpired over the weekend. So if you're anything like me, I mean, this is this is my job. So I try to turn it off on the weekend. I saw all these headlines. And I was like, oh gosh, I'm gonna have so much research to do come Monday morning. And I did a lot. But so this all started last week um, on last week's episode of Orange County, right? It's kind of outed that something's going on with Ryan and he's being looked at by the FBI. So we know now that Ryan has been linked to a $16 million gambling and theft scandal involving Epey Mizuhara, who was Shohei Otani's former interpreter. These are baseball players. Um, Ryan allegedly helped launder money by facilitating payments related to Mizuhara's gambling debts through casino accounts. However, his lawyer stated that he is cooperating with authorities and is not directly involved as a bookmaker. Uh, it's under investigation, but he's not been officially charged with a crime. So Thursday rolls around. Tamara Judge is on Watch What Happens Live, and she blurts out that Ryan was stealing from a Dodgers player. There's a lot of back and forth between Ryan and Tamara and Eddie um, that leads us up to this moment. And we see some of that in the episode that aired on Thursday. Ryan called Eddie soft. Uh, Ryan was questioning their business practices. And Tamara said on Watch What Happens Live, you know what, Ryan, we sell more in a month than what you stole from the Dodgers player. And Eddie is not soft. So that statement could be considered defamatory. So 
Watch What Happens Live has since deleted that little clip from the episode. What does Ryan do? Ryan hires the same attorney that Jim Bellino used to sue Tamara in 2019 for defamation. <laughs> Tamara then makes two Instagram posts about it. The first, she's on video and she said, did you guys watch Watch What Happens Live? It was so good. I will say I was a little bit tired. I did misspeak a little on a couple of things. I didn't mean to say that Ryan stole the money. I meant Vina made more money than what was stolen from the Dodger player, but I didn't mean Ryan. So I apologize for that because like Andy said, you're innocent until proven guilty. Well, Ryan took to the Instagram comments um, and pretty much confirmed that he served Tamara a lawsuit. Somebody commented, uh, about the snippet and said, trying to avoid a new lawsuit, it seems convenience to misspeak on a public platform. I don't buy anything this woman is selling. Ryan responds to that comment and says, facts. I had Tamara served yesterday, hence the apology. Then a second formal apology comes up on Tamara's Instagram story. She says, as I mentioned on my IG story yesterday, I would like to apologize for and correct the record on a misstatement I made on Watch What Happens Live on Thursday about Ryan. I had no reason to believe that Ryan has stolen any money. I misspoke in tying Ryan to the actions of others. I meant to say my company makes more money than what was stolen from the Dodgers player. Unfortunately, I misspoke on live television. While Ryan and I have had ongoing issues, I do apologize to him for the mistake and wish to make clear that my statement was made in era. error. I sincerely apologize, Tamara Judge. Do I believe that she didn't mean to say it? No, I think she meant to say it. She's Tamara Judge. These are the things that come out of her mouth. And um, I don't know. I have conflicting thoughts about this as, as I tend to do. You guys know I'm Switzerland. Um, on one hand, I can understand why Ryan would want to stick up for himself. It's a defamatory comment. She said it on national television and there are consequences to those actions. Um, this might be an unpopular opinion. I hate to say it, but stuff like this seems to be par for the course for housewives. And so I think when you're a husband and you get involved in something like the housewives, uh, and maybe it's wrong, but I feel like you should expect for certain things to happen. Uh, I feel like you should expect if you are you know, under investigation by the FBI, if you don't think anybody's going to bring that up, you are sorely mistaken. Now, when you get in there and start really looking for the opportunities to say, that's not true, I'm going to sue you over that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's interesting. I, I, It's hard because I, I'm like rolling my eyes about it. I'm like, come on, Ryan. Like, it's the Real Housewives. But at the same time, it's a serious accusation. So I don't know. I just feel like maybe he should focus on cooperating Con continuing to cooperate with the authorities and not suing Tamara Judge, to me, it just kind of feels like a way to um, get people to talk about you. Like, I don't really know if it has anything to do with Tamara. You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't know. I go back and forth all the time because, because I say that and then I think everybody's coming out of the woodwork right now to be like, yeah, sue Tamara. You know, Vicky said it. Kelly has said it. Uh, I don't know if Jen has said it, but she's married to Ryan. So it's like, or she's engaged to Ryan. So she had to have given him the stamp of approval. So I don't know. It's just, it seems like an unnecessary mess that I would just avoid. So now on to Shannon. Shannon was slammed over the weekend by uh, Joel Kim Booster, who's allegedly hosting this new show called Love Hotel which is a dating show um, where housewives like Luann, De La Seps, Shannon, Giselle Bryant, and Ashley Darby try to find love. Well, so he's allegedly hosting this show and something had to have happened because he went on his Instagram story and he went off publicly about Shannon. And this is what he said. Just because you're a pathetic drunk on a reality television show best known for a string of failed relationships and a DUI does not make you a star and does not give you the license to treat the people you work with like they are subhuman, period. They will make me delete this, but DM if you'd like to see videos. He then posted another story. Well, that was quick, referencing, I think, them making him delete it. 
anyways, don't regret it. Hope you screenshot it. Hope she suffers. That is a line cross, in my opinion. Then he says, well, let's just say I can't imagine what John Jansen went through. Poor guy. That wasn't all, folks. He then went on an Instagram live to continually attack Shannon. Um, our girl Sam from Bravo Historian posted this on her Instagram. Somebody had texted her, and this is what the text said. He just went on live and cooked Shannon Bedore like he roasted her, chopped her up, and served her for breakfast. She said, she said, has been a terror for the entire three weeks, humiliates the crew, was hideous to him, and that at the rap party just a few hours ago, she was terrible to someone he really loves. And he got in her face and said, you think you're a star? People don't like you. They pity you. And then he said, the daughters are just as bad. Okay. That's a lot. I mean, that's like one way to ensure you will never host something on Bravo again is to post something like that about a housewife, which surprises me because he has made a number of Watch What Happens Live appearances, but it must have been really bad for him to fly off the handle like that. And I'm just sitting here thinking, talk about a good show idea. I want to see the behind the scenes of what it's like to make something like Love Hotel with these housewives. I want to know which ones are insufferable. I want to know which ones were late, which ones don't know what day it is, which kids are horrible too. Like, that's what I really want to know because it does make you think. It's such an interesting concept. And I feel like I talk about this a lot, but it's just a reminder. Was this unprofessional of him? Uh, yeah, absolutely. But we also don't know what goes on behind closed doors. And there's this picture that is painted of any particular housewife. And is it always accurate? You know, right now we see Shannon on the season of Orange County, and she seems very fragile um, at a very low point of her life, right? Really overwhelmed. And we all are collectively Team Shannon rallying behind her, we hate Jim, or not Jim, we hate John, Alexis is annoying the life out of us, we're like Tamara, stop yelling at her, all of these things. But we don't really know how Shannon treats people behind closed doors. And I just have learned in this line of work that if multiple people say that you are one way, then you are. And in the past, I like to have given people the benefit of the doubt, and that has kind of slapped me upside the head a couple times. That said, people are layered. So you could be a terror to people on set. And you could also deserve some sympathy for going through a hard time in your life because you're really struggling. So these things could all happen at one time. I'm just wondering, like, there's been a lot of people that say Shannon is difficult. What in it, whether it's this person who was allegedly hosting the show or one of her best friends formerly of 10 years. So I don't know what to believe, but like be nice to people. Nothing turns me off more truly to celebrities, Bravo celebrities. Like if you're not nice to people, wait staff, crew, whatever, you're gross. That's just how I feel about it. Last but certainly not least, let's dive into the season premiere of The Real Housewives of New York. Um, was not excited about this premiere. I'm just going to keep it 100% with you. I'm not all that invested in the new era of Roni. Will I watch it? Because Yes, of course, because it has the makings for greatness. I mean, New York is such an iconic city. Historically, it's such an iconic franchise. It's just, you know, new things take a while to catch on. And the first season, like we spent really the, the whole first episode of the rebooted season talking about a fight about cheese and going to catch. And I'm like, I don't care. So I had pretty low expectations for the premiere, but I was pleasantly surprised. I will say... And I don't know if this is just because I feel like there's not enough hours in the day. But when I go on Peacock to watch the next day and I see that it's the extended version, I like, ugh, like that's what I do. I'm looking for a 42 minute episode to get through and report back. And when it's 54 minutes, I die a little inside. So that's what happened. And I don't even know what the little extra added scenes were. But what's interesting about this premiere, and I feel like Bravo is getting a little bit more creative in this aspect, and I think it's the um, Scandaval effect, is they're starting to work backwards, right? So we see how the season is going to end with this big blow up between Uba and Bryn, and then we work our way there, right? It even happened last year on Salt Lake City. 
you know, there were pieces of that in the Salt Lake City premiere last week. And, you know, this premiere starts with the girls at their um, tagline shoots, at the intro shoots, right? Filming had already wrapped five days prior, and there's all kinds of tension in the air. And we don't know why, but there's these little um, flashbacks of something we haven't seen yet, this big fight between Uba and Brent. So we know that that's where the season is going. Um, but in the meantime, the little storylines with all the women, Brynn is moving, Jessel is going on the subway after spending $990 on Ubers in one month. Pave is now a food influencer, and that's why he flew to Vietnam and then flew back in less than 24 hours. Uba and Aaron are all of a sudden BFFs, even though they had a screaming match uh, on that little vacation they went on last year. Um, we're introduced to the newbie, Rebecca Minkoff. They call her Becky, which I don't know why, but that just took me back for a second. Um, Uva is in a new relationship. She's talking about having a baby. Um, even though we haven't met him on camera yet, Uva did post a very cute Instagram story of the two of them last week, and they are really cute together. So love does look good on Uva. Um, but you know, the relationships within the group are definitely frayed. There are two fights happening at one time. One being Aaron went on Jeff Lewis and was talking about, um, where Bryn gets her money and making some insinuations about that. And then Bryn saying that Aaron called Jenna Lyons poor because her car broke down and Aaron had to pay the Uber back. Um, in what world anybody would call Jenna Lyons poor is beyond me. And even Aaron is like, I did not say that. That's ridiculous. Like, look at her. We all know that she's not poor, not having money issues. But Brynn kind of, she's just stirring the pot, which seems to be the theme of this episode. Is Brynn going to be our villain in this season of Roni. So the first time that we see Sai in the episode is when she goes cold plunging with Jessel, which I, I'm absolutely shocked that Jessel of all people is going to go cold plunging. Um, but, you know, they're all talking about there's like all of these conflicts, inner working conflicts between them. And there's issues between Sai and Jenna, according to um, I, was it Aaron? Aaron, I guess, said Sai hates Jenna, right? She's like, no, I said I can't stand Jenna, but I never said I hated Jenna. Semantics, right? Then we get new housewife Raquel, which like the name alone triggers any Bravo fan. And I hate that for her. Like, I hate that as soon as she stepped onto this scene, we hear Raquel and we like get a little bit of a jump scare because of all the PTSD that we're dealing with from Scandal. But she does seem like a boss lady. Like, she knows what's up. There's a little bit of scandal in her relationship and how that came to be. I would love to know more about that. I think we are going to get deeper into that throughout the season. Um, but what surprised me a lot about this season premiere, I think the most was this. there's this little bit of tension between Aaron and her husband, Abe. And I think this is also really setting us up for a dramatic season between the two. Aaron gets really mad at Abe for making a joke about doing shrooms and staring at a ceiling covered in cherub wallpaper. And she's like, are you dumb? I can't believe you would just say that. And he's like, what? Like, that's how that's how we joke. That's how you joke. And they showed a flashback of her talking about like, oh, we should like this would be fun to look at on a trip or whatever. And instantly in that moment, I knew, I said, Aaron has got a taste of the comment section. She has gotten a taste of what it's like to be nitpicked. And she is so mad that Abe just said that on camera. And not even a second later, she's in her confessional. And she's like, I can't believe he would say something so stupid on camera. But he then says, like, there's other underlying issues. And she's like, yeah, I'm not ready to talk about the stuff that's going on between Abe and I. Then we see at the end of the episode what's to come on this season and she insinuates that Abe is lying to her and she's crying and she's having a moment and we're like, oh Lord, help us. What is about to go down there? So we end the episode. They all meet up at the floor, the flower. I don't know. I don't know. F-L-E-U-R. How do you pronounce it? I don't know. What I do know is that I've been there before. I saw it and I was like, oh my gosh, I have been there. I'm a New York housewife i actually stayed at that hotel so that um bar restaurant whatever you want to call it is at the top of the moxie hotel in chelsea and david and i stayed there when we went there so, oh my gosh, i'm a real housewife of new york anyways 
this is where it all comes to a head, right? And it seems like Bryn is right in the middle of all of it. All of it. Does Sai hate Jenna? No, but Bryn told Jenna that, right? And then you have this conversation between Aaron and Jessel. So disappointing. Is Bryn unwell? Is Bryn the villain? Because she's in the middle of all of these fights. And I was sitting there thinking like, is Bryn instigating? We're going to call it Brinstigating. Because it seems like that's what she's doing a little bit. But then as soon as she's confronted about all these little seeds that she's been planting, she tucks her tail between her legs and she runs away and she's crying in the corner saying that she's going to leave before Uba even gets there. And I will be completely honest with the premiere. I, I thought there were too many fights going on because I couldn't really keep them straight. I'm like, why is she mad at her? And she's mad at her and she's mad at her. What? You know, but it's the housewives. And I think it's just, they showed us Uba and Bryn to foreshadow that Bryn was going to be in a lot of drama throughout the entire season. So it's like right now she's in drama with Aaron. Now she's in drama with Sai. And by the end of the season, she's going to be in drama with Uba. So overall, I did enjoy it. Um, we'll see how the rest of the season goes. There you have it, guys. I'm going on vacation. So leave me a little review before I jet set out of here. Look, I have a goal. I have a goal and I want to reach the goal. I want a thousand reviews by the end of the year. And it, that is going to take a lot. It's going to take like at least 200 more on Apple and like 400 more on Spotify. And I know how many people listen to this podcast. So that number is not reflective of how many of you are listening to this right now. So if you have not left a review, just do it. Take five seconds, a little five star boop boop, a little lovey like a sis, and you are on your way living the best day ever, living your best life. It's scientifically proven that if you leave a review, you automatically have a better day. So do it. All right. Leave a little five star review. A little love you like a sis, and I'll see you back when I have a little bit more of a tan, when I'm not as pale as when I came out of the womb. Okay? Love you like a sis. See you around, girlfriend. Yes, come in, David. One small latte for madame. I wanted it iced. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh.